Welcome everybody to this Box Europe Live with Paul Nemitz on artificial intelligence, media and democracy. Thank you very much, Paul, for being with us tonight. Just It's before we start this conversation, we'd like to thank you very we'd like to thank very warmly all of Box Europe's members for their support because it enables us to remain independent. And if you're not a member yet, we really appreciate and look forward to your support. To give us and our guest an idea of how European and international we are for this live today, could you please let us know in the chat in which city and country you are right now? Myself, I myself are based in Paris. So we are recording this event, so we asked to make a video to be published later on Vox Europe. Paul only has 40 minutes with us, so if you have questions for him, please write them down in the chat in English, French or Italian and we will ask them for you. Or German for me. Or German, <laughs> thank you, we forgot that. Yeah, so let's now introduce our guests and tonight's debate on artificial intelligence and digital freedom. So the, the title is, will artificial intelligence uh, replace humans, journalists? Does it endanger democracy? How can AI be regulated without curbing the innovations it might bring for the good of all? We are very pleased to introduce Paul Nemitz. Paul is a senior advisor to the European Commission's Director General for Justice, and he's also a professor of law at the Collège d'Europe. Paul is considered one of Europe's most respected experts on digital freedom, and he, in this capacity, led the work on the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. And he's the author, along with Matthias Pfeffer, of The Human Imperative, Power, Democracy and Freedom in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, an essay on the impact of new technologies on individual liberties and society. So, Paul, um, let's start straight away. So, is artificial intelligence an opportunity or a threat for democracy and why? Well, first of all, um, I, I would say that the one of the big tasks in the 21st century of democracy is to control Uh, technological power. Um, and uh, so um, before we come to the notions of threat and opportunity, I think we just have to take stock um, of this fact uh, that uh, power needs to be controlled. Uh, there are good reasons why we have a legal hi history of uh, control of power uh, of companies. We have control of power in states, in the executives. That's why we have Um, the division of powers um, between the different um, emanations of the state, but also vertically. And is, this is something, uh, this principle that power needs to be controlled, uh, certainly um, also applies to AI, as it applies to other technologies and uh, also power of uh, private and public uh, players. So, um, and then be... Once we have uh, made this clear, of course, many technologies and most uh, technologies have an element of opportunity, but uh, also carry risks. We know this from chemicals. Uh, we know this from um, atomic power. And that's exactly why it is so important that democracy takes charge of um, framing and, if necessary, also directing how the technology is developed Uh, in which direction innovation should be going, so it's a normative uh, uh, approach, and um, also where the limits of um, innovation um, and research can be, and where the limits of the use are. Uh, we have a, a long history of uh, limiting research, um, for example, on uh, uh, dangerous biological agents, um, on genetics, on uh, atomic power, all this is highly framed. And so it is nothing unusual that uh, democracy uh, looks at these uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence, thinks about the impacts and uh, takes charge. I think it's a good thing. Okay, so we should regulate uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence, right? So, but in which direction? And as far as the common good is going, Is it possible to regulate artificial intelligence for the common good? And what would be the common good? Well, uh, 
of course it is um, first of all a question of the primacy of democracy over technology and business models i think from that point of view it's good that in europe we make a law you know the word regulation it's an american word it comes from regulatory authorities from down delegating uh, from a, a congress which can't perform its function of legislation which is democratically legitimized to regulatory authorities so i i must say you know when we talk about europe we are talking about lawmaking lawmaking in a democratic process which has full democratic legitimacy through the people the european parliament and through the council of ministers the governments in europe we have co-decision of uh, these two bodies um, um and and therefore uh, this is not just regulation like uh, in the american uh, way and uh, uh, what the common interest is, uh, is in a democracy decided exactly in this process. The parliaments and um, the, the lawmaker in a democracy is the place to decide on the direction of common interest. And the law is the most noble speaking act of democracy determining what is in the common interest and what is not in the common interest. Thanks, Paul. Uh, a few months ago, speaking about uh, regulation and, and AI, some tech moguls uh, wrote a letter that was basically warning governments that AI might destroy humanity if there were no rules. So they were asking for regulation. But many critical experts like Evgeny Morozov and Christopher Wiley in two stories that we recently published say that actually by wielding the threat of AI-induced extinction, those tech giants are actually diverting the public and the government's attention and opinion from the current issues with artificial intelligence to issues that are possible and unverifiable. Do you agree on that? Well, I would say we have to look both at um, the immediate uh, challenges of today of the digital um, economy and the challenges to democracy and fundamental rights today already are real. The power concentration in the digital economy is real today. And AI very likely adds to this power concentration. The big players who are already powerful, who are all in the top uh, 10 of the American stock exchange, these are the most capitalized companies in the world. Um, you know, uh, companies like uh, uh, Alphabet, um, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Apple, um, and, and Facebook, um, they are um, adding to their power because they are also let, at least the systems innovators of the functioning systems of AI, bringing all the elements of AI, which many people work on, many researchers, many startups, but they bring them together into functioning systems. So we have an immediate challenge of today, not only from the technology, but also from the implications um, of this add-on to power concentration in an already highly concentrated uh, uh, situation of power. And then, of course, we also have long-term challenges. But we have to look at both. Um, the precautionary principle is part of uh, innovation in Europe, and it's a good part. Um, I think we have to be proud about Hans Jonas. Uh, he was a European uh, philosopher who immigrated to America, taught at the New School of Social Research in New York. He was uh, inventing uh, the, the principle of precaution. It has become a principle of legislation of primary law in the European Union. And it obliges us also to look at the long-term impacts of technology and make ourselves able to understand as good as possible what the potential terrible impacts of technology can be. And uh, second, if we uh, cannot exclude with certainty that these negative consequences will uh, uh, arise, then we have to take today the decisions uh, which are necessary to make sure that they don't arise, even in situation of information uncertainty. So that is what the precautionary principle is about. And partially our legislation also serves uh, this purpose. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, Elon Musk, uh, him again, tweeted uh, on X that there needs comprehensive deregulations. 
is, is this the way to protect individual rights and democracy? And I know that's a kind of rhetorical question, of course. But... Well, I would first also say to those um, who have called after having put uh, AI uh, innovations um, like ChatGPT on the market, um, and they've afterwards called uh, uh, the legislators to regulate, um, while before uh, this already writing books uh, which uh, in which they said um, AI is like atomic power, you know, especially if you think about Bill Gates, if you think about Elon Musk, if you think about the president of um, Microsoft, Brad Smith, in his book Tools and Weapons, uh, you know, they were all very clear about the risks um, um, and opportunities, but both uh, of AI, but they didn't draw the consequences from this in a quite a cynical way, you know, <laughs> they all... Uh, Microsoft first bought a big part uh, of OpenAI and then uh, they just put it on the market to cash in a few billion. Um, and then they went out and said, and now uh, we need laws. But the parallel to atomic power, of course, would have meant if, if one takes it serious, there should have been a waiting time. They should have waited until regulation is in place. Nobody had the idea uh, when atomic uh, power was introduced in our societies to start uh, operating atomic power without regulation in place. So I do believe that um, if we look back uh, in the history of legal regulation of technology, um, there has always been resistance of business. If you think about the seatbelt for the car industry, it took 10 years until it was uh, introduced uh, in America and also in Europe, people were dying because the car industry was so successful in lobbying. But everybody knew that uh, the death would be half if um, the seatbelt is introduced. And this is actually what happened afterwards. And uh, so I am not impressed if there are some businessmen who say, you know, the best thing in the world is if you don't regulate by law, leave it to us to make the rules. This is the wet dream of the capitalists, um, of the neoliberalists of this time. Um, but democracy means actually the opposite. De democracy means that the important matters of society, and AI is an important matter because it will be ubiquitous. Um, it's already having um, uh, you know, huge uh, impacts in many areas important matters in society, in democracy, cannot be left to the companies and their community rules or their ethics board or their self-regulation. Important matters in societies which are democratic must be dealt with by the democratic legislator. This is what democracy is about. And I also do believe that the idea that all the problems of this world can be solved by technology, like we've heard it uh, from uh, President Trump, when the US left the climate agreements in Paris and he said, oh, technology, we will solve the climate problem by technology. This statement is actually wrong. Um, in, uh, in climate uh, policy, in all the big issues of this world, peace and war, in um, uh, the issues of um, the virus, uh, the coronavirus, we have seen that behavioral rules, how people behave are key. So we have to invest in being able to agree on things, the scarcest resource today for problem solving is not the next great technology and liberating the potential of technology and all you know this ideological talk. The scarcest resource today is the ability and willingness of people to agree in democracy and, by the way, also between countries, whether it's in the transatlantic relationship, whether it's uh, um, in international law, uh, whether it's between parties who wage war uh, with each other to come to peace again. Uh, this is the greatest challenge of our times. And um, I would say um, uh, those who think that technology will solve all problems, uh, you know, there is a certain hubris here. Yeah, thank you. Just very, a very quick question to go back to what you just said earlier, that in, in fact, that means that you do, you, you do believe you're optimistic in the way, in the sense that regulation through a democratic democratic process is strong enough in the end to curtail uh, the deregulation forces of lobbyists? Well, let's say it this way. In America, 
the lobby prevails. If you listen to the great constitutional law professor Lawrence Lessig about the power of money in America, and if you listen to his analysis, why there is no law coming out of Congress anymore, which in any way curtails a big tech, money plays a, a, a very serious role. And it is a very sad account of a democracy um, if it can't pass laws anymore because people just can't agree. In Europe, we are still able to agree. Of course, the lobby is very, very strong in Brussels, and we have to talk about this openly. We have to talk about the money, big tech spends, you know, how they try to influence not only the politicians, but journalists and scientists. You know, they try, they use their money and they have a lot of it to make friends everywhere. Not through open corruption, but buying friendship, uh, you know, research projects, uh, press uh, support, parties, um, events, uh, and so on. So um, there's, uh, let's say, 360 degree uh, GAFAM culture of trying to influence public opinion. And uh, um, in my book, I've described their toolbox quite in detail. And yes, um, they are very, very present, but still, I would say, our democratic process uh, still functions because um, our political parties are, and our members of parliament are not uh, dependent on the money of big tech like American uh, parliamentarians are. Um, and um, I would say also um, that we have a history of civil service, which is much stronger than in the United States. We have much less revolving door issues and so on. I mean, you know, we could go in detail here. So I think we can be proud of the fact that our, democra uh, our democracy is still able to innovate because making laws on these cutting edge issues and transforming the, the idea that internet policy is actually societal policy. It's not a technological matter. It is really at the core of societal issues into laws which then work in the way normal laws work. There's no law which is perfectly enforced. I think this is quite um, um, something we can be proud about. And this is also part of innovation. Innovation is not only a technological matter. Yes, thank you, Paul. You, you, um, you link uh, actually perfectly to what um, one of the big uh, uh, leitmotifs of Evgeny Morozov's um, take on artificial intelligence and, and big tech in general is uh, solutionism, what you uh, mentioned as the idea that technology can solve everything. And um, he's really very much into uh, pointing out that. So currently the European Union is discussing the AI Act, uh, the, the regulation that should, uh, the norm that should regulate artificial intelligence. And uh, actually the so-called trilogue negotiations between the commission, the parliament and the council started today, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so where is this regulation heading? And you mentioned the fact that um, European institutions are not as, uh, as uh, prone to uh, corruption or uh, so this sensitive to money as uh, in the US. Do we know to what extent the uh, tech lobby has influenced uh, this regulation? We know that it's the largest um, lobby in terms of budget uh, within the EU institutions. And can we say that the AI Act is the most comprehensive law on the subject uh, to date? In order to have a level playing field in Europe, a level playing field for competition in the internal market, we need one law. We don't want to have 10 laws or 20 or 27 laws in all the different member states. So it's a matter of equal treatment. And it is, I would say also, the most important thing about this uh, AI Act is that we establish, or again here, the principle of the primacy of democracy over technology um, and business models. That, that is key. And for the rest, I'm very confident um, that um, the Council and the European Parliament will be able to agree on a final version of this law in the trilogue um, uh, before uh, the next European election. So that means by February at the latest. Evgeny Morozov says that it's the rise of 
artificial general intelligence or AGI, basically an AI that doesn't need to be programmed and thus that might have unpredictable, unpredictable behavior, that worries most the experts. Its supporters, though, uh, like OpenAI's founder Sam Altman, say that it might turbocharge the economy and, I quote him, elevate humanity by increasing abundance. So what is your opinion on that? Well, um, I think that we now first have to see whether um, all the specialized AI uh, really are being fulfilled. Let's see this first. I'm I'm not convinced um, uh, by that. Uh, um, you know, it's 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 right now. It's a bus. We have seen tech buses before. Um, the step to um, general artificial intelligence. It's unclear when um, it uh, will arise. Stuart Russell, who I believe is. Uh, 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 one of the most competent uh, people in this area. He is uh, the writer of the most sold textbook on AI. And he has written uh, a book which is called Human Compatible, The Problem of Control, in which he basically says um, AI will never be able, also not as general AI, uh, be able to um, 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 operationalize general principles, like, for example, constitutional principles, uh, fundamental rights and so on. And that's why whenever there's a decision of principle or a decision of value to be taken, the programs have to be designed in such a way that they return to the humans. So uh, I think this thought for the time being should guide us uh, and should guide those who develop uh, general AI. And he also says he believes it will still take decades until we have general AI, but he also makes uh, the parallel to um, uh, the splitting of uh, uh, the atom and he says you know many very competent scientists said it's not possible and then one day by surprise in london uh, a scientist gave a speech on the next day and showed how it is possible so i think we have to prepare for this and we will have to prepare for more um uh, mustafa sulaiman who uh, from deep mind uh, um, uh, who was bought out together with deep mind by google uh, he now says that the next um, step uh, is going to be interacting discourse agents which can negotiate with each other, you know, for contracts and for for maybe also for political matters and find agreements. Um, there are many fantasies out there how technology will evolve. I think the important thing is that um, public administrations and also parliaments and, and governments stay on course and watch this very carefully. <laughs> and we need an opportunity obligation to truth um, from those who are developing these uh, technologies often behind closed doors. You know, there is an irony in EU law. When we do competition cases, we can impose a fine if big corporate lies to us. Um, Facebook, for example, received a fine of more than 100 million for not telling us the full story about the takeover of WhatsApp. But there is no duty to truth when we consult as commission in the preparation of our legislative proposals or when the European Parliament consults in, uh, to prepare its legislative debates or trilogue. Their business lies. There's unfortunately a long tradition of digital business and other business. You don't want to exempt the German car industry and the diesel gate, you know, same type of thing. Um, there is a tradition of not only breaking the law, it is incredible how many decisions have been taken in competition law and in data privacy and so on against big tech companies uh, where it has been shown that they are not complying with the law. They also don't tell the truth um, uh, when they are in discourse uh, in, with uh, governments and legislators. And this has to change. So I think what we need is a legal obligation to truth, which also has to be sanctioned and we need a culture change please, because increasingly we are dependent on what they tell us. And, um, you know, there, um, there is an issue if politics is dependent uh, on what business tells them, then we must be able to hold them to truth. Okay, well, that, that's uh, it's, it's great to hear that they are fines, of course, but my question would be, are these fines, uh, do they have any impact 
on companies? I mean, do, have you seen that the fact that even if Facebook is has a fine of one you know million dollars, does that make any? Do, do they act differently? I mean, does what does it mean for them in terms of money, in terms of impact? So it sounds maybe like a naive question, but maybe that's all we have. Yeah, I, I I think uh, fining is not everything, but uh, we live in a world of huge power concentration, and we need counter power. And the counter power must be with the state. So we must be able to enforce our laws, and if necessary, with a hard hand. And unfortunately, these companies largely only react to a hard hand. By the way, also in America, uh, the biggest fine, for example, on data privacy in the world doesn't come from a European uh, Data Protection Authority. It comes from the Federal Trade Commission, uh, which imposed a $5 billion fine on Facebook. And, you know, in America, when you look at the SEC, the stock market regulation, financial regulation, and also the Federal Trade Commission, America knows how to deal uh, 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 with capitalism, namely with a hard hand. Uh, in America, people go to prison when they do a cartel, when they agree on prices, in Europe not. So we, I think, have to learn uh, in this respect uh, from America, we must be ready and willing to enforce our laws with a hard hand because democracy means that laws are made and democracy also means that laws are complied with. And there can be no ex exception uh, for big tech uh, in they this. They mean that we're moving towards a more American no, it means we must take it serious that we need to enforce our laws and enforcing laws, unfortunately, often makes it necessary to be able to fine. So it is important that we have fining basis. Uh, and as you know, in competition law, we can fine up to 10% of world turnover of big companies. I think that has an effect. In privacy, unfortunately, it's only 4%, but still, you know, I think... Um, these fines do have and they must have um, uh, an effect of motivating boardroom members to make sure that their companies comply. This being said, this is not enough. We must also always think that in a democratic society, counterpower comes from citizens and it comes from civil society. So it's also very, very important that we empower citizens and we empower civil society to act for citizens and with citizens and in place of citizens to avail themselves of their rights. We cannot leave individuals alone to fight for their rights in face of big tech. We need public enforcement and we need to empower civil society to fight for rights of individuals. Um, I think this is part of the big package of controlling the power of technology in the 21st century. And all of this will guide innovation. It's not an obstacle to innovation, but it guides innovation towards a public interest and towards middle of the road legality. And that's what we need. We need the big powerful tech companies to learn that it's not a good thing to move fast and break things if the break things contains the principle of breaking the law. That is not a good thing. And disruptive innovation, yes, but not if it disrupts the law. Because, you know, um, <laughs> I think we are all in favor of innovation. And certainly uh, Europe is, in terms of productivity, you know, we are an innovative continent in many respects. But it undermines our democracy if we allow that powerful players can disrupt the law and can break the law and they get away with it. That is not good for democracy. Yeah, Paul, speaking of getting away or leaving, if you prefer, uh, lately, and, and also it illustrates the balance of power between uh, tech giants and uh, regulators, um, Thierry Breton, the uh, European Commissioner for Industry, has wrote, written a letter to Elon Musk uh, uh, telling him that uh, if X continues to um, favor uh, disinformation, uh, uh, try to make it short, uh, he might it might encounter uh, some sanctions from the EU. To which Musk replied in a typical uh, Silicon Valley style, "Okay, but in this case we might leave uh, Europe. Um, basically, we might leave Europe, and other tech giants might be also tempted to do the same." 
if they don't like the regulation that uh, Europe is setting up. So what is the balance of power between the two? And if you don't mind, the second question from uh, uh, Stefania again, uh, could an unconventional use of AI be uh, dangerous? So two different um, topics. So I remember also that Google sometimes said they will leave if if we push forward copyright obligations, you know, for Google News uh, usage and so on. So I would say it's very simple. You know, I'm a, a very simple person in this respect. Democracy can never be blackmailed. If they try to blackmail us, we should just laugh them off. If they want to leave, they're free to leave. And I wish uh, Elon Musk good luck on the stock exchange if he leaves the UP Europe. Unfortunately, fortunately, we are still a very, very big profitable, ma profitable market. If he can afford to leave, goodbye, Elon Musk. We wish you all the best. And what about the danger of the unconventional use of AI? Yes. Um, unconventional meaning uh, the use for war, of course, that is a danger. There is work on this in the United Nations. Um, weapons which are getting out of control are a problem for every person who understands uh, security and who understands how military works. Military wants to have control over its weapons. And um, in the past, we had countries agree um, uh, in multilateral agreements, not only on um, uh, non-proliferation of atomic weapons, but also uh, small weapons, weapons which get off out of control, like landmines. So I think uh, in terms of the common interest of a world of humanity and governability, um, uh, work needs to uh, progress. Uh, on rules for the use of AI for military purposes. These talks are difficult. Sometimes it can take years, in some cases, even decades to come to agreements. This was also like that in the past. Um, but eventually, I think we do need such rules uh, for autonomous weapons, um, uh, certainly, and in this context, also for AI. Okay, Paul, I had uh, one last uh, quick question i don't know whether you can give us a quick answer given the fact we only have one minute left but it's just to go back to what chris wiley said in the article we mentioned that in a way the current regulatory approach does not work because i quote it treats uh, artificial intelligence like a service not like architecture and so we are regulating security to consent uh, do you share that opinion and then maybe you can then be a conclusive conclusion I would say that uh, the bar for what works and what not works or what is considered to be working and not working in tech law should not be higher uh, than in any other field of law. We all know that we have tax laws and we try to enforce them as good as we can, but we know that there are many, many people and companies who get away with not paying the taxes. We have intellectual property laws and they are not being obeyed and so on and so on. I mean, you know, there's a long list and we have, uh, you know, murder is something which is highly punished, but we have murder on a daily basis. So what do I want to say? I think um, in tech law, we should not fall into the trap, which is the discourse of the tech uh, industry, which says, you know, we'd rather prefer not law, no law than a bad law. And then they start describing what a bad law is. And a bad law is a law which cannot be perfectly enforced. My answer to that is, there is no law which works perfectly, and there is no law which can be perfectly enforced. But that's not an argument against having laws. Laws are the most noble speaking act of democracy, and that means that they are a compromise. They are a compromise between the lobby interests which these companies carry into the parliament and which are taken up by some parties more than by others, and if the majorities in the parliament are what they are, then people shouldn't be surprised that, you know, some of their ideas of the lobby ideas from big tech flow into the laws. And because laws are compromised, they are not perfect from the side of science or functionality. They are creatures of democracy. And it is in the end, I would say, better that we agree on a law, even if many 
consider it from different optics, eh, imperfect. You know, in Brussels, we say, if at the end, all are screaming, business says, this is too much an uh, innovation obstacle and too expensive, and civil society says, this is a lobby success, then probably we've got it more or less right in the middle. 